things. People always ask me why there's so many jump cuts, you know, like I cut forward three seconds maybe sometimes. Why do you cut out those three seconds? Because when we went to London, that opening line that you came out with and we were stood outside of King's Cross. <laughs> there's no way you've just come up with that on the spot. I've seen how much effort or like thought, which again, looks effortless on the video. The amount of thought that goes into the, the opening line of a video. And I think you get your dictionary out in the morning when you're, <laughs> when you're having a poo and go, what word can I put in to confuse everybody today? Yeah, that, no, that's just the, the only thing, the only good thing about doing a, a, an English degree at university. Big Mix Food. And I'm Josh Goodgen. And welcome back to the Breaking Bread Podcast, where each episode we have a good old-fashioned chinwag about some interesting topics, or topics we hope you'll find it interesting, as well as being joined by an occasional special guest from time to time. If you don't know, I'm what they call these days an online content creator, and Josh over here is a professional videographer, has his own video production company, and uh, he's been known to dabble in the world of YouTube on occasion. I dabble a little bit. I mean, look at my uh, my flack. <laughs> uh, since we've started uploading to, to YouTube these podcasts, it's gone up by 10 subscribers. Ooh, so we're getting there, mate. Yeah, I just thought I would mention that because we didn't really mention it in the last episode. And people might just be sat there thinking, who the, who the heck are these fools? Who so that, that's that's who we that are. guy? Yeah, well, now you know. If yeah. you don't know, now you know. How are you doing anyway? All right, you've brought the energy this morning. Yeah, like, well, it's the, I, I, I didn't bring the energy. Nescafe brought the energy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, uh, we're doing this one nice and early, so I've got plenty of energy now. Yeah, I'm excited. I mean, I've got some breaking news for you as well. Oh, yeah. So... Just in our Spotify exclusive deal, <laughs> I still yet to land. <laughs> I thought I'd just bring it up to keep the you know the listeners in the loop. That, one day, um, one day. I think we're in negotiations now. Like they've, they've reached out, <laughs> confirmed. They've not reached out yet. Still it's, early days. Early days. It's going to come. It's going to come. I'm excited for this episode, mate, because it's something close to both our, our hearts. We're going to talk about um, sort of how to become a video creator or YouTube entertainer, as it says in your LinkedIn bio, not LinkedIn, Twitter bio. LinkedIn? I don't, I don't have a LinkedIn profile, no. Um, yeah, I'm, that's, that's the phrase I like to use because I hate the, the term YouTuber um, because it kind of tells you with the same brushes. Um, people like, you know, Jake Paul and stuff like that. <laughs> I, I kind of like it. I mean... Yeah, I, yeah. No, I, I, I prefer, I think YouTube entertainer, I, I, even that's kind of reductive because I don't just do stuff on YouTube. But... Um, I don't, I don't like labels. You know this about me anyway, I know, but um, I, I think YouTube entertainer is um, sufficiently, it's, it's not grandiose. I'm not making myself out to be some, you know, big shot. It's just like guy that does daft stuff on the internet. So we'll, we'll go with YouTube creator from now on then. I might often drop in YouTuber by accident. So just right, if you can <laughs> refrain from flipping the table because we know what you can get like. <laughs> You're like a, the Tasmanian devil. Just <laughs> you say there's like another joke about me being short. I'm 5'10". So that's like average size. Yeah. For a 10 year old. <laughs> <laughs> what are we talking about this week? So we were going to talk initially about just where our inspirations come from for our content. So we, we sort of put some show notes together, but initially let's talk about your channel and where does your inspiration lie? Because I'm kind of a firm believer that there's nothing original anymore. So I'm not saying that you can go out there and copy people, but you can be inspired by various creators. So who inspired you to start or where did you where do you take inspiration from when creating content yeah i think well to echo what you said is it's inevitable that you're gonna even if you don't mean to actively copy something you're gonna take inspiration from things you have seen yeah. in life that's just like how life works forget you know uh, video production um you're always going to kind of regurgitate stuff and that's not a bad thing um and yeah there's very little which is truly original left in the sense that somebody has thought of an idea which has never been done before um but yeah, it's natural that you're going to be inspired by, by, um, and people by, by, it's natural that you're going to be inspired by people. <laughs> What's in this coffee, man? <laughs> Put your teeth back in, lad. <laughs> it's natural that you're going to be inspired by people. And, um, I don't know, it's like, it kind of shifts from time to time with me. Like what I'm, what naturally what I'm watching, I might take, um, inspiration from, but like big ones are, um, I mean, I watch a lot of films. So I mentioned to you before Edgar Wright, a lot of people won't know Edgar Wright's a director. He did a lot of, um, a lot of films like directors do, but um, he works in mostly comedy and he does a lot of visual comedy. But the reason I love um, what he does is a lot of uh, the comedy in his films is delivered by the act of what is happening in the camera, um, which we were talking about this yesterday. A lot of people watching a film or anything, a YouTube video would not necessarily know what goes into it. They would just see it as, you know, for yeah. what it is. And it's only when you get into filmmaking, if it's 
what I do, like the, the lowest level to what Josh does, which is the mid level to, you know, your Scorsese stuff, which is the top level. Um, and um, yeah, he does a lot of original things, which are like evocative of, um, they're almost kind of cartoonish in a way yeah. in that he, he gets, he's known for doing a lot of really original kind of transitions and stuff like that and, and making what is occurring in the camera look dynamic. So you very rarely would get a static shot, say for example, like this, where there's nothing really occurring. Um, and I try and integrate that into some of my videos to make parts of them interesting, because I think when you make videos, especially as a one man band, um, it's natural that it's going to be run and gun stuff and, and it's, or it's going to be a fixed shot. So if this, if I was eating right now, there would be a camera where Josh is and, um, it would just be, you know, it's not doing anything right. And that gets boring, you know, even if there's things happening in the frame. So, uh, yeah, I, I try and, um, emulate stuff like that, but there are lots of people that I watch in that. And I, I think, oh, that's good. I would like to do something like that. Yeah, I think a lot of people probably won't realise, and this is like the, the sort of purest side of it. When you're just entertained by a YouTube creator, by a film, it all looks effortless. And we've touched on this before. And I don't know whether I, I like the fact that I now know what's going on so I can appreciate it more, or I kind of wish sometimes that I didn't know what was going on because like I, I, I watch a lot of things now and I'm, I'm looking for flaws or I'm looking for technique. I'm yeah. looking for a missed color grade. I'm looking for a missed color match between cameras. Uh, and it's, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Do you find that now that you have obviously a lot more advanced? Yeah. I mean, like we always talk about this um, between ourselves with, with color grading, for example, which is basically just making footage look good. Yeah. really that in simple terms but i uh, because uh, when you create videos on youtube th th there's a, a forgiveness to it you know like people people 99 out of 100 people watching a youtube video are not going to be looking for whether the colors from two cameras match up right they're just not absolutely not but for the creator for me for example i get it wrong all the time especially because i'm an idiot and i use two different brands of camera which makes it even harder but to me like i know most people aren't going to care about it but you still want to get it right but yeah, for sure. Like if I'm watching from that, from the highest end film to a, like one of my mates, uh, YouTube videos, I'm going to be looking for things that are there. And I think, I don't think that's a bad thing because I think if nothing else, it makes me appreciate directors of films and producers because, and, and colorists and sound designers, yeah. because a lot of times if I'm watching a film, like say I watch, I don't know, um, what's a new film it just came out? The new Bond one. Have you seen that? I haven't seen it, but yeah, seen say, say for example, I watched that. I probably, if, if I watched that, if I didn't know about film making to the extent that I do, I probably wouldn't give much of the credit for that film to that the director when he should get the vast majority. Yeah. Because I mean, obviously the, the actors play a, a huge part and stuff like that, but the direction of a film, there's a reason good directors exist. There's a reason people know the name Steven Spielberg, yeah. for example, because it's the work that they do, which, which essentially is what crafts the end product. Yeah. And I think if I didn't create a uh, video like I do now, I probably wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't know about, I'd know about those directors, yeah. but the, the kind of smaller indie ones, I probably wouldn't know who Edgar Wright is, right? And he's like a legend to me now. I think what we should probably say is if you are listening to this and you are wanting to get into YouTube, we will sort of, we're going to go back to the basics. So we are going to, in this podcast, run through the different aspects of creating a video. We've kind of gone in a little bit heavy there with sound design, colouring. These are all things to consider, but on day day one, it definitely don't, don't sweat the small stuff. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. You don't, that's, especially that's, on YouTube. Yeah. But we obviously, so that's one of your inspirations. Who else is one of your inspirations? It's it's hard to pick out like one name. I, there's a, a, a guy that I, um, I'm good friends with now, uh, a guy called Nathan Figueroa, who makes YouTube videos, right? He does eating videos like me. He's a little bit more kind of vlog orientated. His videos are probably a little bit more... Um, interesting and you know there the, more things happen than just him eating yeah. food um but um i remember um years ago must be like four maybe four years ago originally seeing his videos and being he, he was the first guy i saw um on that that was kind of in that eating space because there are a lot of people that do what i do yeah. um on especially on youtube and um i remember watching his videos and it was the first time i saw one that was really good uh in terms of production value um, and it had like the, the really nice B roll, which showed you the food, you know, nice and up. It wasn't just cause a lot back, back then, a lot of the time an eating video would be, hi, I'm X. Yeah. This is what I'm going to eat today. And it's just one fixed shot. There's nothing really dynamic happening to keep you engaged. And all of that, I'm not knocking that. I mean, mukbang channels, like especially, yeah. um, in certain countries as well, that they're, they're really popular, nothing wrong with them. But like, I think what I wanted from my content was something a bit more, you know, immersive. And he was the first guy I ever saw that put like so much effort into the production. Um, and I thought, you know, I, I don't want to say like I copied that, but certainly took, um, if you look at one of his videos, you'll be like, 
this actually looks like There's some similarities and for sure he came before me right but I, I didn't want to kind of copy it but i thought like i want i like that being in a video it it feels more like a story like here's what i'm gonna eat yeah. this you know and there was more traveling shots some drone shots and i'm like right, i want that for what i do uh but I, I i don't use the same lenses and the same gear and stuff so i try and make it i, I just try and put effort in yeah I, I mean you've mentioned his name a few times to me and i mean obviously we've spoke for years and you tell me all these different names of eaters and, and whatnot and it's not often that i can sort of jump on a channel and straight away but when you mentioned it yesterday i jumped on his channel and immediately i was like one, it's, a, it's amazing. Like the color, the shots, the transitions, I was like properly blown away. And then I immediately saw your sort of style in it. Yeah, yeah. And I, like it, it almost made my head fall off. And this sort of goes back to like nothing that you see is original, whether you might get more views than him or whatever, but you, you vice versa, people take inspiration from yours and you've taken inspiration from him. Um, and what you were saying, it's very similar from my side. So you look at Peter McKinnon. So what you just described, McKinnon is kind of the first person that came sort of, I guess, mainstream YouTube doing the really cinematic B-roll sequences, um, beautifully exposed shots and color, which is quite funny because he initially wasn't, a, he was a photographer. He wasn't even a particularly good videographer. And you can see that in his initial content. So if anybody's out there listening, thinking, I want to become a video creator or a YouTube creator, pick your favorite creator, go on to uploads and then go like do the tab and go to the oldest videos and watch how bad they were. <laughs> like watch beards, watch mine. Don't, don't watch mine. I mean, for God's sake. Unbelievable. Like you to see how far he has come. Um, but yeah, he was the first one that sort of dropped on the scene in that style. Um, and again, you've taken inspiration from his work as well. Like you look at him and go, it almost seems unattainable, I think. Yeah, I still look at McKinnon's videos and I'm like, how on earth does it look this good? Yeah. I mean, even stuff like it looks, because... Things like YouTube compression, like when you upload to, to, to YouTube, like it's compressed, right? Which, which is going to affect the quality of it. And I'm like, well, how is it still looking this good after that? But, but the dude is a professional video. It's, but it's the same when I look at your videos. I still look at yours. I know you're using a lot of the same gear that I've got. And I'm like, whoa, that, that looks really, really good. And, but I think you don't, if you listen to this thinking, oh man, this sounds like hard work. You really don't need to get carried away with making things look like this, for example, yeah. because you got to factor in what you're doing. If you're a vlog channel, people are going to forgive the fact it's not going to look perfect all the time. If you're running around with a, uh, you know, a, a DSLR or a mirrorless camera in your hand um, and you're changing scenery, you know, the white balance is going to shift. People forgive that to an extent. Yeah. Um, but yeah, for sure. McKinnon was one of those that like, I think the, the odd thing about his channel in a good way is that it's, it's well watched and it's, it's viewed by a lot of people who don't necessarily give a shit about cameras yeah. because he's that, that, that's another thing which, we, I mean, we're going into a lot of different things here, but that you could learn a lot from that because I'll watch a Peter McKinnon video because I just like Peter McKinnon. Yeah. He seems like a, he's a, a wacky dude, right? He used to be a magician back in the day. Covered he's, in tattoos, cool he's, looking dude. Yeah, great at talking to camera and everything. Um, so that tells you how important kind of character is as well. I'm not yeah. saying be fake. We could get into that probably at a later date. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, you know, like uh, your your character, you know, it, it, that that can be what leads to success of a video as well as the quality. Yeah, and another it's sort of another inspiration of mine. So this comes before McKinnon. Is Casey Knight's that? Like I've got a five foot by five foot painting in there, like of of the original sort of profile picture of Casey Knight's that, and, and that, I think it, it looks great in the studio. But he again, the art of storytelling. It's weird because like that's almost it's almost like people know that now it's almost like a, a done thing or Casey Knight starts a, a wicked storyteller where people don't really understand what storytelling is Casey's shooting style is so raw like it's so run and gun he don't care if the white balance is off he don't care if the shot's framed correctly it's it's it really doesn't matter he'd rather get the story than get the shot which is the exact opposite of Peter McKinnon you can tell that Peter, Peter McKinnon has meticulously taken out each shot you know every frame's perfect if he's probably had a couple of runs at the at the dialogue just to get it perfect and the two completely opposite sides of the spectrum but yeah casey for me was like the og he's the first one that i watched religiously and went that's what i want to do i literally i, I ditched a career at sea i was like I, you know I'm, I'm he means there. actually in the navy yeah he was actually literally at sea he doesn't mean like figuratively, figuratively <laughs> he's like he was actually in the sea i was yeah literally in the sea had a really good career and i just i was just watching Casey content and watching probably a little bit of McKinnon because he started to come onto the scene a little bit later and went, that's what I want to do. Yeah, and, yeah. And that's kind of what I did, you know, four years ago, five years ago. That I was like, right, let's take the jump. Casey was the guy I think that inspired a lot of kind of just YouTube growth in general because I think people realized at that point, right, okay, I can do this. 
um, some people in a positive sense, some people in a negative, because you can you can go into things and just kind of be shooting on your iPhone and whatnot and just think, oh, my life is really interesting. But I think what people don't often see um, in, in Casey's content, content um, from the get-go is how much you're writing that he's, he's just kind of running going, it's raw, but there's a lot of work that goes into the, the story. And he, he's, yeah. he's always conscious, I think, of what story he's trying to tell. And that's the difference for me between what is a good vlog channel yeah. because it tells a story you're invested in whatever is happening. Like I remember one episode, he lost his drone, I think in the middle of New York City. Yeah, yeah. Probably shouldn't have been flying it there anyway. But, um, and the whole story was him trying to get the drone back, right? It's really simple. Like if, if that happened to me, that I wouldn't make a video of it. No. I certainly wouldn't be able to make a really compelling, I, mean, I could try. Um, but you, the, the polar opposite of that is when you see vlog channels and it's just like somebody, they go into, I don't know, Zara to buy yeah, some clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, not that anything. Does Zara still exist? I don't know. I'm not the most fashionable bloke, but like it's just somebody to go, or they go to Tesco to do a shop and it's just like, Hi, I'm, I'm, I'm blogging today. And there's no real, there's nothing wrong with that. But like to make really compelling content, which appeals to a lot of people, st- there's a reason story is important. Yeah. And there's a reason why he is, the, the, the number one, like, I don't think, I can't imagine anybody's going to take the top spot off him in the vlogging space because it, he was beyond obsessed. Like if you, I've listened to many podcasts, I've listened to him on, he recently did one with Steve-O from Jackass and it was so insightful. Like it almost cost him his marriage. I mean, he vlogged 500 days straight, right? So you can imagine what his missus must have thought. All he did was wake up on a morning, right? What's the first act? What's the second act? He even went into to detail to say, I wouldn't even meet friends or do business meetings if they weren't going to add to the story for that day. Imagine vlog, imagine that being your only f- thought. And he, he was saying, you know, like when he was playing with the kids on a night, he was there, but he wasn't present. It was just kind of going through the motions until, you know, seven o'clock, the kid goes to bed and he can start editing and edit till, you know, two o'clock in the morning sleep for two hours. And then right, we're on to another vlog for 500 days. And I'm like, it's, when I think of the, when I think back to that, I just think, I, I don't understand how it's, I can't comprehend it, you know, because like I, I know like shooting two, two videos a week, how much, how many hours in, in, in a week that takes for yeah. me, including the shoot, the travel and the edit. I cannot think of anything worse. Like if I have to shoot three days in a row for whatever reason, if I go like I just went to Canada yeah. um, a, a month or so back, that, that was hard work for me to shoot like three days in a row and edit three days in a row, you know? So to do that 500 days in a row, and, and with the commitment that he's saying to people, I'm vlogging every day. Yeah. Like I, I can't wrap my head around it, but it certainly deserves to be applauded. It's, it's similar to an elite athlete in it really, you know, like yeah. a, an athlete dedicates their life to uh, one thing and he dedicated, you know, a couple of years to one thing. And obviously he's got a lifetime to, I mean, he's got brand deals coming out of his backside. Can enjoy it now, yeah. He's got plenty of money, but it could have gone either way. It could have destroyed him. You know, you hear a lot of that, don't you? Certainly, like, personally, really, I mean, I know how much it stresses out. You probably wouldn't think it till, well, maybe you would think it if you watch my <laughs> videos, but I know Lindsay, Mrs. Beard, um, how's, and I, I certainly don't blame her, but sometimes she gets, she'll get stressed out if I'm stressed out trying to create this or that, you know? Yeah. Um, even when it's like, you know, it's goofy content that, that when you got to get serious to, to make a video because you know people are expecting it because yep. they're looking forward to it and stuff. There are times when, you know, it, it affects your relationships, especially for me as well, because like if uh, what I do, I can't eat five five days a week, you know? So it means like, you know, going out for families, with family for, for meals or whatnot, yep. or going out for a few beers with the boys. Um, I, like I can't do that. Even just basic like functioning, like, you know, completing a 10,000 calorie meal or whatever it might be, you know, X amount of pounds of food coming home and then having to try and entertain any form of small talk when all you probably want to do is either sleep or spew, I don't know. Like you're, gonna, <laughs> you're just going to be laid down on the sofa rotten wanting to watch a bit of football, cranky. Like I can't imagine, like, yeah. But again, you're, I suppose you're very similar. You've dedicated many, many years to honing the, the art for, honing the craft. You've got a million subscriber plaque behind you. You know, like you've, you've kind of cracked it. What? Well, I don't, think, I don't think you ever crack it though. We, we, we talk about this all the time. I think even people like Casey Neistat who have actually cracked it, you know, <laughs> um, there's always stuff that you want to do, you know, and I think the, the, the further along you go, the less happy you are with, with mediocrity, you know? So yeah. like there, I, I can't, this, this last year, for example, there are probably 10 videos I've made this year, which I have not uploaded because I thought they were so bad. Now they probably weren't, especially no. compared to like what has gone before a year's a year ago standard you but, but you like as you just expect better of yourself you know and that that increases the the pressure on you but i mean i'm not i don't want to get my violin out and be like oh it's so hard um because you know i'm very privileged to be where i am but uh yeah there, there are parts of it which are difficult it's really that is really tough is that and i, I obviously you you're the only person that can judge your work really 
when we watch it as sort of fans or people that enjoy the the channel we i i obviously break i can look at it and break it down and just see the effort that's going into it but i also see the comments where people are like you found this you filmed this on your iphone <laughs> it's, just, it's like how far have i come for you still think i'm on an iphone yeah i know that's that is mad but I, I, I don't blame people you know a lot of people expect that because there are channels out there there's nothing wrong with using an iphone by the way i know a couple of creators that do use an iphone oh, yeah. they, 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 then i know one actually that uses has always used an iphone various iterations of the iphone but has a million subs yeah, yeah, um, yeah. We should we should probably mention that you definitely don't need to get caught up in the gear. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people I think find that prohibitive from the start. They'd be like, because people ask me like, what what gear do you use? And I'll riff a list of my twenty thousand quid's worth of kit which I've acquired over you know time because yeah. this is now my job. And they'd be like, well, I, I can't afford that. I said, okay, you know, I, mean, I started out with like a basically a potato camera that I didn't know how to use, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, and you can get like even if you want to produce stuff that looks nice, you could get. A, like a Canon 80D or a 70D Mate, used. I think, I think the barrier to entry in 2021, 2022 is, it's there, it's in your pocket. You know, yeah. if you if you look back even just to, I mean, how long ago did you start on YouTube? Six years, I think, ish. Yeah, so I mean, I probably started creating like four years ago. And even then I could have got away with a phone. You know, it was only because I started going to the sort of professional sphere that I started dabbling with mirrorless and DSLRs. Um, but today... The new iPhone that 13 Pro that's just come out, that has got cinematic mode. It's, you can shoot in a high frame rate, so you can get slow motion. You can attach an external audio. They've, they've got um, stabilize, image stabilization. It's it's the better than most. If you bought an 80D, I was just gonna say, is this an ad? Do you want to get do you want to get the phone out, shoot the camera? <laughs> no, but come on, Apple. Do you want sponsors? It's true though, isn't it? You know, like yeah, yeah. If yeah. you bought an 70D or an 80D, you know, on Facebook Marketplace, it hasn't got image stabilization. It shoots in 50 frames at 720. You know, like yeah. it's. You've got better than that in your pocket. Yeah, you do. I think that I don't. I mean, I don't know what the new thirteen is like, but there are there are limitations to what you can do with a an iPhone. But it's certainly not, especially these days, not to the extent that people think. If you, I mean, especially when you get that in the edit, yeah. you pay whatever is it one hundred and twenty, one hundred and fifty quid for Final Cut Pro now. If that, I mean, or, I, I got a copyright strike for um, for telling people how to get Final Cut Pro for like for free forever. Oh, yeah, I remember you yeah. doing that video. Yeah. Tim Cook came at me. I was like, so <laughs> it is, yeah. They, they, took, they took the video off my channel. They're like, Apple's copyrighted, yeah, copyright strike. I'm like, oh, well, I had to go to, did you know that if you get a copyright strike on your channel, you have to go to copyright jail. You basically have to go through like a, this training course on establishing to YouTube as to what's copyright and what's not. I, technically, I don't think it was copyright. That's not under, under, under the, the terms that YouTube applies. That's not. But that, I mean, it's Apple. I suppose if they're claiming your stuff, like YouTube aren't going to tell them to start off, are they? They're going to no, exactly. like, I'm going to fight. What? Well, I'm going to fight. I didn't. But it, it was my video. I didn't oh, yeah. take any of their work. But they were like, no, you can't do that. Which is fair enough. Probably it was a bit dodgy. Yeah, yeah. but I mean, I, if you if you were to get to come back to the point I was making, you were if you, if you were to get like Final Cut Pro or even like a free video editing uh, yeah. suite, you know, and an iPhone, you, there's a lot you can do. Um, there are limitations, but I mean, it shouldn't stop you if you want to create a video. It shouldn't yeah. stop you. You mentioned yesterday uh, Daniel Schiffer as well. Yeah. I love Daniel Schiffer's stuff, yeah. I know you do, but I, I, th- I think um, a lot of people won't know. I mean, McKinnon and, and Nice, like, not, I don't want to say the household names. Yeah. Like, my mum wouldn't know they are. But a lot of people that watch YouTube will have come across them at some point. Daniel Schiffer, I'm not sure. But if you're into cameras and editing and video production, you probably will have heard of him because his stuff is incredible. Um, and he, again, he's an, another guy that makes it look effortless. But yeah, I, I love. I, I yeah, love he, stuff. he's a, he's sort of a specialist. His channel that just um, he teaches tutorials on how to edit various ways, and, and mostly in like in camera transitions and masking and all these like really advanced. It is really advanced stuff, but he he, he dumbs it down for idiots like me, um, <laughs> so that we can have a go at it. Uh, and yeah, he's, he's amazing. You know, like we've we've done bits before, like a couple of years ago um, at Christmas, we made a coffee video. Oh, um, that was that was wild. I love that. It's one of my favorite videos ever. Yeah. We're just saying that because you because you sat here, yeah. But I could tell it was inspired in in a way by yeah. uh, Daniel Schiffer, but it was, man. I wish I could make B roll like that, you know. It was one of those things where we uh, and yeah, like of course it was. We saw I saw a Daniel Schiffer video. Uh, I spoke to my mate Joe, and I was like, oh, I really want to try this. And we'd only just moved into this studio, and I just said we had our Christmas trees up, and I thought, like, what could these sequences look like? What does it look like to make a cup of coffee? Right, we'll do that. Uh, and then I found a jingle on Epidemic, which like a perfect Christmas song. And I knew that with the right sound effects, I could get the transitions and it just pieced together perfectly. And what I found was, it was trial and error, right? So I had to edit as I was going along. So I, I got the shots edited, then got the next shot. So I, by the end of the day, I had a rough like outline of what this video was and then and sort of finished it. Uh, it came out amazing. 
but it's sort of it was nice to do it that one time i've done it similar on a couple of shoots you know i've, I've done some brand videos for, for various restaurants and stuff but now i wouldn't dream of doing it because it goes these styles go through waves and this sort of goes back to that originality like your channel is really successful because you've you've adapted your style over time but you've sort of stayed true to what it is that you do whereas like i think in the filmmaking world it can all become a bit samey and that's one of those things that if before that it were gimbals then it were drones then it was daniel schiffer in camera transitions then it would peter mckinnon whatever like you pick a peter mckinnon track and just put it in 100 frames um so i'm, I'm sort of i'm in, interested to see what the future might hold in the in the filmmaking niche yeah, there's, there's a limitation, like we said at the very start, to how far you can take things in terms of originality. I think that there's a timeless quality to uh, to what people like Schiffer do, though, because you just look at that and it's just you're like, whoa, the grade's amazing, like the way everything moves. And that people, I think even people forget what music and sound design does to a video. You know, oh, yeah. you, you could, if you shoot stuff in, like I, this is a technique I use a lot, like I shoot in 100 frames per second, right? It's especially if I, I'm not really, maybe it's one that I'm, it's, it's kind of like... Uh, I'm phoning it in for the day, right? I've had a busy week doing this <laughs> and that. And I think I'm doing a video today, but you know, it's, I don't want to spend nine hours doing the first minute, which happens, right? Um, and I'll, I'll just be like, I'll shoot this in a hundred frames. So it's in slow-mo, right? Which looks like, you know what you're doing. <laughs> Not really much effort. And then I'll pick a track and then that's it. A bit of sound design in the background. Yeah. So if, if somebody's dropping like the plate on my table, I get a little sound bite of the plate being dropped on the table or whatnot. Some, some ambience, you know, and that makes without that much effort, can make it stuff it. look uh, look good, yeah. But um, yeah, I think the thing with shifters as well, it, it kind of it makes other people look bad in a way because, like, I think so. You watch his B roll. B roll basically just means supporting footage, right? Which yeah. is not the this. If it was me, it wouldn't be the frame of me eating the food. It's me introducing what I'm about to eat, right? Um, but you, you look at what what Josh has just described and what he does. He's, he's literally got a laptop there with him as he's doing the shoot and he's importing the footage. So don't look at something like that and think, oh, this is what I have to do, you know, because you got to take into account, I, I could never do that. I couldn't be whipping my laptop out on the table yeah. while the food's getting cold and spending four hours doing the B-roll. Um, but you, you can serve as a source of inspiration without you have, having to, you know, copy it directly. Yeah. Well, on the uh, on the topic of copying then, um, I want to just touch on like how many, as you've sort of grown in, in the YouTube world, how many people have copied you? Like, do you, uh, do you see it a lot? I don't to be honest, I, I don't really watch that that much. YouTube, when I do, it's usually uh, my mates' videos, you know, a lot of time. Or Bob Ross. I love watching Bob Ross. I find it relaxing. But there there are, sometimes people will send me other people's videos yeah. who are getting started in the same space. And, and uh, they'll be like, oh, what do you think of this? And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll watch it. And I'll be like, okay, well, this has got audio commentary. Yeah. Which I think I was pretty much the first person to do in terms of, I might not be the first, there could have been somebody before me that I'm not aware of, right? But I thought it was a good way for me to, because I hate videos which are just, there's dead space in them, you know? Yeah. Because people, we could do a whole episode on how important pacing is in YouTube videos because people have such a short attention span now. If there's any part of that video which something is not happening in, it's a chance for them to click off right, and be like, I'm done with this. Um, but yeah, for me, like audio commentary was a way for me to just, that's the most fun I have, I think, in doing the video. When you're talking to yourself. Yeah. When you're yeah. like, come on, mate. Yeah. It ain't that, that bad. You you wouldn't you would <laughs> you'd be surprised how many people would be like, oh man, it's so cringe. Like, why are you laughing at yourself? And I'm like, man, I've just eaten this food. I spent whatever, 20 hours editing the video. This is the part where I get to look back at it. And, and it's usually three days or four days later. So some of it doesn't seem new to me, right? But I don't have a photographic memory. So I'd be like, oh, I remember that happening and it'll make me laugh, you know? And I'm a pretty happy go lucky guy, right? So I'll be laughing at myself. And I think that gives something to the, yeah. the the video, right? And I'll see that in other videos. And then I'll see, um, I do a lot of, uh, to make videos dynamic, I'll, the, the frame might be fixed, but I'll kind of crop in on the edit. So it's, it's zoom, like if I'm going to say something daft, I'll zoom into my face a little bit. And that's certainly that's nothing new, but I'll, I'll notice that other channels do it and they'll do, use the same effect. And then the motion blur thing, I wasn't the first person in a, in a time-lapse section when I'm eating really quickly just to make it more interesting, you know, and fill a bit of dead, yeah. dead space with something energetic. I wasn't the first person to add motion blur, but you'll see people add the motion blur and the same kind of crop in effects and the same shake effect and the same sound effect. And I'm like... There's nothing wrong with that. I kind of take it as a compliment, right? But th there is a very real trap when you're creating video that you just become someone like, else. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, it kind of cheapens what you do if you don't find things that make you stand out. Yeah. Um, I, I, as a person, and it's all right to take inspiration, but you don't want to 
get bogged down because I want to make the same thing. I mean, they say imitation is the best form of flattery, don't they? Something, I've probably butchered that quote. Well, somebody said it, I don't know who it was. But I've, I've definitely heard that many times and that's my biggest fear. I think that's why with my channel, I'm not as active or I'm, I'm not as, I, I felt myself going into this, so 2020, I launched my, like my channel, had a really good year, um, creating filmmaking content, my style, behind the scenes, in the business. Um, but then brands started reaching out. They're like giving you free gear. And you kind of look at it and go, Oh yeah, well, yeah, I'd hate that. No, no. <laughs> but the, you, you know you know full well, you'll, you'll get a, a brand deal email every day saying, oh, let's give you this for free if you make X video. The amount of time it takes to make X video isn't worth the value of said item. Yeah. Hardly ever. And everyone else does it. So then you you kind of, I felt myself going into this little hole, you know, I've got a few thousand subscribers. I started ranking with the other YouTube filmmaker dudes. And then I'd get sent something and I'd be like, oh, you know, let's launch this video on this day. But then you just fall into, like, you just become beige. Like I, f- I just felt myself becoming beige and I was like, this is awful. Like, this is not what I started. That's that's a good way to put it, actually. That's not what I started doing it for. And people were like messaging me like, oh, have you grown your channel so fast? Have you done so well? Like, and it's not a massive channel, by the way. I've only got like a few thousand subscribers, but... No, but what, you, what you're trying to say, the growth of your channel was really, really impressive. Like yeah. from, from me looking out in in the first year, so I know what you say, you, yeah. you, you, you were making really good videos, um, but I think what you're going to say is you weren't enjoying Yeah, doing so it. I just started not, not enjoying it as much because it were... I, I started creating videos for, I guess, for them, like for, for the brand or for the... Not even for the audience, because the audience was so scatty anyway because if you're doing like a tech review, you know what i mean if you're doing a tech review they're not there for you like, i was gonna say transient yeah they're not coming back for your yeah necessarily for you but just for what just, you're doing i got fed up with it so i i, I did we did over two videos a week all year for 2020 which led so the ones that did like the ones that i really put effort into and the ones that did well were the behind the scenes vlogs so we did we shot the um videos at the badminton world championships just as coronavirus were hitting right so obviously a toilet roll shortage. And I thought this would be funny. Like, this is a story. So like I got my case and I started on. I'm like, right, lads, we're not shooting until 6 p.m. We've got all day in Birmingham. We're in this Airbnb, three lads, three days in, zero toilet roll. So like, that's, a, that's a hook of a story that I'm yeah, like, yeah. let's go find some toilet roll. We'd seen it all over the news. I'm like, let's just go find some. So long story, the vlog's still on the channel. If anyone wants to look, long story short, we, we went to probably six or seven places, genuinely could not find toilet roll, which just add to, added to the, <laughs> and Josh, the, one of the guys, we mentioned him on a previous podcast. He obviously needed to go to the toilet. So we sort of built that up as part of the story, like it was like a secondary storyline. He needs a poo. We're, we're like, you know, <laughs> six or seven shops into it. Josh still needs a poo. And, uh, you know, we, we, we've got the shots of like empty aisles finished it off is Josh in the shower naked doing a waffle stomp, which obviously he didn't poo in the shower and stomp it down the drain, but it was a, the perfect end. And like, for me, that is, that's a body of work that I was like really, really happy with. Like it's, it's all, it looks awful now when I look back at it, the color grade's awful. It was all running good, but the, the story was amazing. Comes to end of 2020, Google used some of our clips in the end of year review. So you can imagine I'm, I'm in between Jimmy Fallon and like Matt Lucas talking about what's happened in 2020. And there's just me and Mike on this like aisle in Birmingham in a Lidl. There's no toilet roll. They should, they should have paid you for that. You should get paid for that. I don't care what they say. I saw that, that in, right? But um, but it was pretty amazing for that. Like, And I'm so happy that that, if you took my, my work for 2020, that was the one that was taken. Cause like I, I thoroughly enjoyed making that video. Yeah. And then some of the tech reviews, I just wasn't, wasn't that bothered about, but yeah. My point being, you've got to do what you want to do. You've kind of got to be true to to your what what you want to create, which sort of leads on to like what, what we're doing here. You know, I've always been a fan of podcasts. You've always obviously been a fan of podcasts. So for us to be able to just sit and put the world to rights in this capacity, it's pretty cool. Talk nonsense for a long time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's fun. You mentioned that the style of Mr. Beast seems to be like the done thing. <sighs> yeah, I, that's not me saying that I've got anything. Again. I'm, I'm not digging out Mr. Beast for God's sake. Who's got the biggest YouTube channel in the world Ever. um and that, that i don't care what anyone says that that doesn't come just as a result of luck you know it, re- it comes as a result of some type of hard work a lot by him but a great deal i imagine by his team because when you get that big you know you, you, you're not doing it all by yourself um but what what I, I don't dislike the editing style what i dislike is the fact that 
every channel I see now, especially in that kind of um, either vlog or drama niche, you know, where people are doing kind of clickbaity stuff. Yeah. Um, they all start the same. You can bet your bottom dollar that every time you click on a video that's, that's on trending and it's from one of those types of channels, it'll start with a wide shot. They'll do a crash zoom, which that's what that's what it's called, right, Liam? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's a wide shot and it does like a handheld yeah. zoom in on the barrel of the lens. So it goes, goes from, that's actually something Edgar Wright popularized yeah, originally. Right. Yep. He does it far better, but like they'll start with a wide shot, zooms in, and then the, the talent or the creator or whatever will be really energetic, you know, and they'll flail their, their limbs around. They'll be like, ah, you know what we're doing today? We're going to, I don't know, spend 24 hours in Tesco. Um, and that that's fine, right? I'm, I'm not getting it, but like that is, that's taken from, what Mr. Beast is, and then it'll be overlaid with a bunch of graphics, some kind of cartoonish stuff, which maybe it's meant to appeal to kids or like a younger audience and stuff like that. But the so things that, that there are all these tropes of of Mr. Beast, right? But then people think, okay, I'm going to take that and I'm gonna, I'm going to use that exact same thing yeah. on my channel, and that's that's fine if you want to take some inspiration from it. But I, I hate the fact that so many channels now look the same. You could almost not set the creators apart yeah. if, you, if they didn't have faces. I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think it is made for kids. I think we live in the TikTok generation now. I know, I know like we all go on, apart from Adam doesn't know TikTok, <laughs> but you know, we've gone on TikTok. Instagram reels are priori- prioritized it. Our attention span has got to be the shortest it's ever been. So, and I've spoken to people like, you know, Paddy Galloway, have you seen him on Twitter? Like he, he's a, a consultant, a YouTube consultant for many, many creators, big creators, like the biggest channels. And they are meticulous when they're creating a video like Mr. Beast or that, that style that every, not even second, like literally every frame is thought about the timing and the pacing. I mean, we, we spoke about pacing before, but their pacing is just ridiculous. If you watch a Mr. Beast video, they don't even want you to have, have time to blink or breathe. If they think that you might even pick your phone up, you know, to check a text whilst watching it, they're going to change something. Like that's yeah. how meticulous they go through each edit to be able to maintain that pacing. But like you said, it's, you can fall into a trap. That's a sad thing to me as well. Is it like, I, I could, it's a funny thing. I was, I was, I don't know who I was talking to the other day, um, but I was, it was, like, it was like a comment on, um, was it Twitter? I don't know where it was, but um, I said something like that I, I know to, to me, the priority, of, of course you want to have your videos viewed, right? Because A, that means that people are enjoying what you're doing. B, it means you can pay your mortgage. But I think if if you prioritize the uh, the amount of views you might get above what you want to create, that's a really kind of shaky uh, space to be in. Because to me, I know for a, a a cast iron fact that I could, I don't know how much the uplift would be, but I know I could get more views on every video I make by tweaking one thing in an edit. I could show what I'm about to eat from the frame one. Yeah. So I I did a video in Canada, which is, um, I knew, I, I mean, by the time this goes up, that video will have gone up and it might tank. But um, <laughs> I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, this is going to be really popular because it's a giant slice of pizza. I'm like, people are going to relate to that, going to want to watch it. So I could get, the maximum amount of people to watch that video by the first frame of that video would be me pulling the pizza out. And then I could tell the story, you know, yeah. but to me, I, I, I don't want that to, I want to tell a story like a story should be told. Right. So it's me. I don't know. I, I'm not waking up. I don't think at the start, but I'm like, Oh, I, I do a, a kind of a, a bit of a gag, um, to, to the camera, which is supposed to make people laugh. It's nothing to do with pizza. It's just me being goofy. Right. And, um, then it's the journey to the pizza place. Yeah. And then it's me talking to some of the staff at the pizza. And it's one of the, my favorite edits, if not the favorite edit I've ever done on my channel, right? So I'm, I'm that happy with it. But I, I know that I could have got more views totally. if I edit it a different way, right? But there's a, there's a degree to which you have to think, is this what I want to create? Do I want to be like everyone else? And is it the most important thing to me that I get a million views instead of 800,000 views yeah. or 300,000 views? Or is it important for me to tell the story I want to tell the way I want to tell it? Yeah, I, I completely respect that as well because you could quite easily, if you were chasing the views or the clout, you know, like you you could quite quite easily start adapting your content to make sure that you are following these new school rules for, a, you know, to, to capture a potential new audience. But you have, you've always stayed true to yeah, your I, style. I, I don't do any of that. You know, like when people say, and I'm not, I'm not knocking people that do, because depending on what type of content you create, it might be a good idea to follow trends. So like um, if you do film reviews and the new Bond movie comes out, yeah. naturally you're, you're going to review that film and probably a lot of other channels are going to review that too. But um, yeah, there, there, there are things that I think can stay sacred, right? And it's more important for me to just organically make stuff that I think is good than for me to think, well, I need to get more views and I don't want people to click off at this point and that point. 
if they click off, like, fine, you know. It's yeah. kind of a sad thing that we live in a, a time when, you know, attention span is short um, because it's not like that with a film, is it, if you watch a film? But, um, yeah, I think if those people want to click off and don't want to watch, that's that's cool. I'm, I'm happy with the fact that, yeah. okay, only 200,000 people will watch instead of 2 million people, you know. Yeah. I'm happy with that. Yeah, I think it's uh, it's a tough one, because I've, I've sort of done a bit of consultancy with various different people, whether it's just on filmmaking or a little bit of YouTube, you know, just a bit of advice and... You, you can look at the analytics and you, you can get bogged down in the numbers because when you're first starting out, people like people want to get that first thousand subscribers or, and then the first 4,000 watch hours. And you can take a lot from the numbers. So I think it's easy for you to sit there today and go, right, I don't look at the analytics because you've, you've a million and a half subscribers, you know, hundreds of thousands of views per video. As you're starting out, be, be totally true to yourself, but don't be don't disregard the fact that there might be some massive errors that you're making that could be quite easily rectified to then elevate your content. So yeah, yeah, for I think sure. I definitely think it's this, the story and being true to what you want to be as a creator. And then you can adapt this, the various parts, but it's, there are, there are things you can change about a video. I mean, I've made a conscious decision. If you look at my channel, you will see that if you look even a year or two years back, probably the average video length was about 12 to 15 minutes. Now that average video length is about seven to 10 minutes. Yep. And a lot of people get mad about that because they want longer content, but that, that's actually a conscious thing that I thought I want my videos to be, um, we, we keep talking about pacing and probably people listening might not know what we're talking about. We're talking about there being no points in that video, which are not entertaining, that yeah. give you the opportunity to say, right, I don't want to watch this anymore. So that that's a, a contrivance for me. Like I, I could have kept them longer and a lot of people would have been happy. But I, what I thought was, if I watch this back objectively, this feels a bit slow at this point. It feels a bit slow at that point. So yeah. I take things. People always ask me why there's so many jump cuts. You know, like I cut forward three seconds maybe sometimes. Why do you cut out those three seconds? Because if you're cutting that to a beat, you know, pff, 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 it yeah. gives it a dynamism, which makes it seem more fun than it really is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the reasons why people say, oh, why, why do you never say where you're going to be? I'm like, look, I'm, I'm not that interested in real life, you know. Just watch the video. You really so, watch. That's quite funny, actually, because I never want, like, so... The, I never in my life want to meet Peter McKinnon. I don't want to meet Casey Neistat. All these people I enjoy watching their content, I never want to meet them because I understand what it takes to make a video. I've been with you on shoots. I've seen what it's like when you're setting up for a shoot and you're you know, dealing with a restaurant and all these things that the audience never get to see. When you walk into a restaurant and the guy clocks who you are and goes, tell you what, let's make this six pounds heavier. <laughs> it, we're only a four pound bloody I uh, think in the, in the first place and it co comes out 10 pound. This is the true story. Like, it actually happened. And you're like, what are you thinking? Like, you know, th this isn't, it's entertainment. You are, you are the number one competitive eater, but it's not a competitive, you're not doing competitive eating there. You're making a piece of content. Um, so yeah, that's, I never want to meet any of those guys. They say like, don't meet your heroes, yeah. right? Um, I've, like, I've, I've, if you see me on the street, I, I don't really share that. You could come up and say hello. You know, <laughs> a lot of people say I've got like resting bitch face, right? They say like, I look grumpy. So I get these messages all the time on Twitter. They'll you be like- seen Snow White? Uh, well, oh, the, oh, <laughs> um, what I was gonna say is, because I get messages all the time on like Facebook and Twitter and stuff from people saying, oh, I saw you here earlier on, but I didn't want to come over because um, you know, you, you look like you're in a bad mood. I'm like, no, you should just, you know, you yeah. could have come over and asked for a picture and whatnot. Um, Cause that's what a lot of people do. And I'm very thankful for that. But um, yeah, I think a, a lot of people see that it's not a fictional version of you, but like if I meet Casey Neistat or Peter McKinnon in real life, they are not going to be like they are in the video. And yeah. I know that cause I've got common sense, right? Um, because like, nobody's perfect. People no. have their off days and bad days. Like, if I catch Pete McKinnon in the middle of a, uh, or just after a, a, like a 12 hour shoot, I get the feeling he might be in a bit of a bad mood and yeah. I'm going to be all right with that, right? But uh, no, I get what you're saying there. Yeah, I just, I enjoy that. I mean, most, you know, whoever it is, I enjoy seeing like the finished work and that would be 99% of your audience. So there's probably only 1% that want to see that other side of what it actually takes to make it, but it, here's what it is. That's why we're having this conversation. Mate, we, we've gone some good time into this podcast and we haven't even- Feels like it's been a long one. Won't even cracked it. Yeah, I mean, let's let's qu like quickly move on to. Um, I guess there's four aspects to creating a video, which I suppose would be helpful just to add a bit of context to each section. You've got pre-production, shooting, editing, and then distribution. Um, so, what goes into for you the pre-production of a video? Yeah, we, we, we'll timestamp this so people can skip ahead to the tips for, <laughs> <laughs> for YouTubers. Um, pre-production for me is, I think it's a little, it's probably a little bit more slapdash than it is for most people. 
because I try not to contrive things too much. So I don't have a schedule yeah. really that's, unless I've got a, like a book in for, from like a restaurant that actually wants, and that's quite rare because I don't like doing them. You know, if a place books me to, to eat a bunch of food or whatnot. Um, but for me, it's just trying to come up with an idea, which I think is going to be fun. So if it's like, more common, the most fun I have is if I see a restaurant and they have like a food challenge on the menu, right? And I go and do it. And it's an inbuilt story. I don't really have to work much other than maybe a couple of cags, a bit yep. B-roll and stuff that makes it funny. But that is your pre-production, isn't it? So obviously when you talk about um, the gags or the opening line, I've seen how much effort or like thought, which again, looks effortless on the video, What the, the amount of thought that goes into the, the opening line of a video. You know, you're quite an articulate person. I think you get your dictionary out on a morning when you're having, <laughs> when you're having a poo and go, what word can I put in to confuse everybody today? Um, so that's part of your pre-production. Yeah, that, no, that's just the, the only thing, the only good thing about doing a, a, an English degree at university, a non-vocational degree, you can't do anything with it, but you have a slightly better than average vocabulary, yet you still use the word delicious all the time. When, when you- <laughs> <laughs> the delicious count in the corner. Yeah, um, so much so that there's a drinking game now people play whenever I say the delicious, the word delicious. Oh, can you do that on the Christmas too, Liam? We'll, <laughs> we'll stick a beard video on it. <laughs> but um, yeah, so the, the, uh, but if it's, there's probably more pre-production that goes into something which is, I would call a more country. It used to be the Sunday night video, which is something like usually something daft. Like I, I did um, Paddy Pimblett, right? The the UF the MMA fighter. I did his um, daily diet um, a, a while back, and I, I did that with the conscious effort, uh, conscious knowledge that he was, you know, he was, he was all over the social media at the time. Yeah, yeah it was blowing up. Um, yeah, gone viral as they say these days. <laughs> and I, I thought it'd be funny because I just somebody actually sent me the video of him talking about his McDonald's, his last McDonald's cheat day before lockdown. He's a funny character, you know. I thought I could do a Scouse accent, which I do a lot of time, you know, p- poke fun at that. And, um, I can confirm that you can't do a Scouse accent. <laughs> Mike has told me we've got Come Scouse on, that works. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I, I, that, that was... That was um, but I, there was an idea that, I, you know, I've got a script. I don't have a script, but I have an idea of bullet points in my head. Yeah. So I'm going to say this is this is who he is because nobody really knew him at the time, especially people that don't follow combat sports, right? So that's what goes into it, that I think about what B-roll shots I'm going to get, if there's anything funny I can say. But that probably ought to takes me a couple of hours, you know, as, as I'm, it's not really, I, I sit down and brainstorm stuff. No. Um, so I try not, I try to still be organic, you know, because you don't want it to sound like you're reading from a, an auto cue, yeah, you know? Yeah. But it's clever. It's clever. I mean, when we went to London, that opening line that you came out with when we were stood outside of King's Cross, <laughs> I'm like, there's no way you've just come up with that on the spot. Top, yeah. I, I I can, can you remember what you said? I, can't I remember. said something about, I made it, it wasn't really a gag, but I I said, I called London, Londinium, which is what it used to be called, like, um, by we'll, the, the we'll Romans. We'll cut it in, Liam, cut it into the edit, like. All right, so today we're in the, uh, the bustling metropolitan dystopia of londinium and it, that wasn't supposed to be funny but i like to do something which seems a bit quirky rather than just saying because i hate that seeing those videos where it's um it's typically people maybe they're shooting for like viral content sharing pages or lab bible and it'd be a guy that they've just said can you stand in front of the camera today like yeah. just an intern or whatever and um if they don't really know how to be natural and stuff and they'll be like oh i'm, I'm in london and i'm gonna go eat this so i try because i'm a bit wacky right i'm a bit of a quirky <laughs> kind of guy so i just thought oh, it might be a laugh to say we're in the londinium today yeah formerly known as london and it's not really a joke but it's like it's something that i think just makes it a bit more interesting than just saying all right mate i'm in london today i'm gonna go eat some food it took me back because obviously like you were like right we're gonna shoot this now and you just rattled it out and i was like because i said to you have you been drinking like what <laughs> i've yeah. just sat with you for two hours on a train and then you come you come out with that <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there are typically the first few lines of a video are going to be not necessarily scripted, but I would have thought about well what I'm going to say. Out. Yeah. All right, so then we get into the the meat and potatoes, the shooting. Any tips and tricks for that? You're the best person to ask for that. I think for me, it's just I do I do the best I can because a lot of the time I would like to film things better than I do, but for me. Um, I'm just trying to expose it as well as I can. Yeah. Because I shoot everything I shoot in log, which people might not know what that is, but it's essentially it's a, like it's like a grayscale, a really flat palette, which is essentially you saying to your camera, I'm gonna sort out the colours in the edit, in the post uh production. You just shoot like in grayscale, it improves the dynamic range of your camera, yeah. etc. So but in doing that, you need to make sure the colour is as good as it can be, the exposure's right. And I often get it wrong, very, very often. And I save it and you might you might see some of my videos and think, wow, this one looks really good. And then others you'll be like, that looks fucking terrible. What was he doing? <laughs> um, but yeah, for me, that's that's it. And because I've got to worry about the food coming out, yeah. I do I have the camera in hand when the waitress comes with the food to, to get the shot? 
it's not like having a crew. So like if Josh ever comes with me on a shoot, I'm, I'm a bit more relaxed because I know you can get some of that stuff. It's going to be way different for you because... Yeah, I mean, just to be more, I guess a little bit more broad. I think if you look at whatever you're doing, think about what could add potentially to that storyline. So we spoke about B-roll. B-roll is just supplementary footage to bring context to what, either what you're talking about or where you are or what you're doing. Um, you'll see Beard use it a lot with the transitions from one location to another, from a drone shot into a car. Um, if he's sort of sat there explaining what the meal is, he will then show different items of the meal. If you're a, a vlogger or, you know, uh, let's say you're a beauty channel, get the shots. So get the shots of the various little items because it, it makes it so much more dynamic and you've got to consider the audience when you're shooting. What could bring this to life more? What could emphasize it more? And it'd be a case of, yeah, let's just add a few more shots in, just elevate it slightly rather than just a static shot of, of you talking. Yeah, so it looks more like a, a film or a TV yeah. show. I, I mean, the... You don't, you don't want it to just be one fixed shot because that goes back to pacing. Um, I'm not trying to preach to you, do what you like. But um, <laughs> if you're just sat there and you're talking about stuff, it's it can become dull, you yeah. know, because people don't have the attention span for it. They're used to the TikToks and the, you know, Instagram shorts and all that stuff. Um, so, yeah, just uh, make sure you get s- things that can flesh it out a bit. And it's not hard if with a bit of plan and a bit of foresight. Yeah. I know what shots I, I get now. So like you said, I could apply that to a different channel. If I start, if... if uh, Mrs. Beard starts a beauty channel. I'm I, She's not going to know what to shoot, right? Yep. I'll be like, let's get this. But are you going to be using this makeup brush? What makeup are we using today? I get like a nice shallow depth of field. And th- those, that sounds hard. I whip on a Nifty 50, they cost, they cost what you get used for about 80, 80 quid. Well, here's an example of what, a sh- what the shallow depth of field is. If you look at um, either this shot or Adam's shot, you should see my shoulder and, and this in the foreground. He's perfectly sort of exposed and in focus, but then the uh, Beard Meets Food plaque at the back, they'll be out of focus. So that's just a bit more of a dynamic shot rather than just, that's you. It, yeah, it, look, it looks fancy. Basically, in, in simple terms, it looks fancy, <laughs> even though it's not very hard to achieve. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's I suppose that's the, the shots element. Yeah, I mean, we're editing, we've already spoke about that quite in detail. You know, the various ways that you could possibly pace and, and that's so specific to whatever uh, niche that you choose to go in. And then distribution. This is quite a good one, actually, because obviously it goes without saying you distribute on YouTube. I, I, I Even my business clients, I'm like, get it on YouTube. Google on YouTube. It'll rank. You'll rank for SEO if you're answering a question. So a lot of my, the reason I had sort of success on YouTube initially was in the videos. I was answering questions. So I was doing like searchable content. So whatever you'd sort of type into Google, like I think there's one video that's still ranking number one, like um, five tips to talk on camera. Well, that's a, that's a well searched question. I've got the answer for that. So it, Google now ranks that video as like number one, um, above even like a blog post or whatever. Um, so YouTube, but Facebook, you know, you get a lot of your uh, dis- well, clout, a lot of followers, a lot of interaction. Yeah, I mean, that's the word I'm looking for. I put my teeth back in interaction on Facebook. Yeah, I mean, you got it's natural in the same. Think of it like a business. If you have a business, you're probably going to have a Facebook page. You probably it's free to set up, right? And it's easy for people to follow. You're probably going to have Instagram. You're probably going to have Twitter. If you're below the age of twenty five, you might have TikTok. <laughs> if you're into dancing, you might have TikTok and whatnot, right? Um, but that's it's just a way to to reach people. That's yeah. all it is, you know. I, I I don't really I'm not really into social you won't see me posting 40 times a day on facebook and twitter and stuff like that it's just a way from if i a video will go up tonight on my channel and i'll post a link on facebook with some probably some daft pun about what i mean <laughs> i'll post on twitter and i'll post it on instagram right and there'll be a, a story on instagram that you can just swipe up and get to right and if you mention in your description or in your videos that you have these channels you know facebook twitter etc it's just a way by which people can engage with you as well. So people yeah. send me messages. I'll be honest, I, I, I try to get to as many as I can. These days it's really difficult to get to all of them because I'm just one man, but it's just a, a way of networking, right? But just at like a high high scale, you know? Um, and there's got to be somewhere that people can. And things the, the good thing about social media um, is that if a video goes up on Facebook, people are going to comment about it, which might which is then going to mean their friends might see it and yeah. whatnot. So it's just a way of uh, achieving growth. You just touched on that, that as well. Um, obviously, collaboration is a good way to grow. So if you've got a good value proposition, for example, if you want to work with another creator or meet another creator or get in contact, they are all a DM away. Obviously, it, it goes that same when you get to a million and a half subscribers and hundreds of thousands on social impossible for you to reply to everybody. I imagine that your request folder is maxed out, never mind your actual DM folder. 
Um, but they are a DM away. So if you ever wanted to collaborate with somebody that you think you could add value to, or, you, you know, vice versa, or somebody of a, a channel of a similar t- size, you can collaborate and sort of share the audience. And I think that's a, a really sort of poignant thing. People think it's hard to get in contact with various creators, but they are a tweet away, a DM away. The, to be honest, the, the, the easiest way you're going to get in touch with a creator is if you go onto their YouTube channel and go into the email section, send them an email. That's the most formal way of doing it. That's the most likely way you'll get in contact with me because I get, that's where I get a lot of my business related stuff. So yeah. if people are asking me to do, um, you know, this and that, all kinds of stuff, TV stuff, interviews and all that, that's going to come through email. Yeah. So it's, it's more likely I'm going to see that than a YouTube comment because YouTube 100%. comments, I mean, that's like a minefield. If you think about 500 videos on which there's, I don't know, 10,000 comments on every, you're yeah. never going to get to everyone. It's just not doable. Yeah. It's not, there's no way. Um, so yeah, just bear that in mind. Right, last couple of things, mate. What do you think the key is to a viral thumbnail? Put me on the spot. The, the light is achieving the same effect. I feel like I'm on the spot here. Um, <laughs> I don't know that I'm the best person to ask. I think I know what makes one. I don't make... People underestimate the importance of thumbnails, right? So it's good. A thumbnail, by the way, is what... When we're talking about that, is we mean the video you see when you click on a video, right? So you'll see the title and you'll see an image, right? Yeah. Um, and it's important that is compelling because... Otherwise, you know, who's going to click on it, right? Yeah, they say don't judge a book by its cover, but on YouTube, it is exactly that. Yeah, because, I mean, it doesn't matter how compelling your title is. um, People aren't going to click on it if it doesn't look interesting. And you essentially have a space, 16 by 9 space, to introduce people to the fact that this is what they should be clicking on. Um, So it's got to look compelling. For me, it's probably a lot easier than, say, for a, a vlog channel or a beauty channel or, you know, a car channel or whatever because what compels people to watch my stuff is it's just me with usually what looks like an insurmountable portion of food in front of me, right? So be like, oh, you'll never finish that. And, you know, or new people would think that and click on it. Um, And it's super colorful. It's super vibrant. Yeah. I think you're like, I know your brand. So you're just the the way that you look, obviously you've got a beard, you wear a backwards cap, you you wear, you know, a 12 year old t-shirt with some (laughs) outrageous wording on it. Like that's, that's enough to sort of go, ah, oh, I'll click on that. So like that, that's. Yeah. I mean, I'm, image isn't every, this is not like a conscious decision. It's not like I normally wear suits and stuff, <laughs> just like a normal 35 year old or whatever in my, in my normal day to day life. But yeah, it's important to have a character, but I think everyone does. And, but I mean, when it comes to thumbnails, yeah, they need to be bright. Like if, if you look at one of my thumbnails, that is not what you would see with the naked eye. If you were in that scenario, the, the saturation is bumped, you know, and it's, I try not to contrive mine too much because there were times in the past when I would like everyone, there was a stage when everyone would um, cover uh, like in the eating space, everyone would, whatever the food was, they would uh, Photoshop like an outline of a shadow. So yeah, it, yeah. it stood out against the background. And I did that a couple of times and I was like, nah, it, look, it just looks like everyone else. And it, I like the idea that mine's just nice and simple. Right. Mm-hmm. But if you're in a space where it's not abundantly clear what the video is going to be. So if you're doing a talking head video or something like that, just try to make it as interesting as you can um, without selling out to just looking like everyone else, you know? Yeah, I think my, my only tip would be on just a thumbnail, not a viral, because I've never particularly had a, a viral video, um, would be when when you create that thumbnail, you might use Photoshop or Canva or whatever, and you, you're on your computer screen, you've got this big, large sort of 16 by nine frame. What I'd say is shrink it as much as possible because you've got to imagine what does that look like on somebody's phone? You know, um, um, I, I dread to think how many views of yours are on mobile phone versus a TV or a laptop. What does it look like? So if you're going, let's say you've got the, the frame and you're designing it and you put a little word here and a little logo there and a little spit over here. When that's compressed down to the size of a, a literally a thumbnail, you can't see what it is or what's going on. So you've kind of got to go basic with it somewhat so that it's, it's visible on a really small device. Yeah, that's really that's a really good point actually because I, I see so many um, thumbnails where I mean I, I hate text on thumbnails. Sometimes it's it's relevant, right? But you see so many cluttered thumbnails. It's like a person's face and there's some naff looking text, and it's like I, when this is like you say shrunk down to you're not even gonna know what it is, right? So yeah. try, I would say try and keep it minimalist most of mine are pretty minimal i don't really do anything with them apart from put them through lightroom and make them look nice it's very consistent as well across your like so like you said you've, you've got consistency across your channel and on, so we produce for a guy called ben pearson those listening or, or watching may have seen some of his videos he was a former police interceptor um we created a channel where we we're just telling these sort of basically horror stories 
Um, and I've made a full video explaining how we sort of broke it down, but we managed to get this channel to close to like 60,000 subscribers in four, four months, three yeah, months, that's crazy. 4 million views. I think it's on now. It's mental, but every aspect of the pre-production, shooting, editing, thumbnails, distribution was thought out beforehand, which led to the success as well as obviously a compelling story that, you know, he basically sold his soul to the devil to be able to sit there and tell those stories. But if you look at his thumbnails, I basically copied Lad Bible, you know, or co copied Lad Bible and Joe Rogan. We, we took a frame of him with some sort of expression on his face, uh, a, a, a box next to him and a text box underneath. So there is text on that, but it's super basic so that, on the smallest device, you can read what it says. So it might be like fatal collision, you know. Or that make, I mean, that makes sense because yeah. it's, it's nice and concise, you know. But every single thumbnail looks exactly the same, which is the consistency and which has then sort of led on to why the channel has be, become such a success. Um, yeah, for sure. Put, put effort into them, but um, effort doesn't just mean making them as convoluted as, as possible and putting as much in there. It just make, means make it look nice. And yeah. it's not always the case that if your thumbnails are uh if your videos are doing poorly or what you can consider poorly it's not always the, the the fault of your thumbnails you know so don't be always it's consistency is a good thing in the same way that it is for a professional brand for somebody who creates content on youtube that, that if they all look similar maybe it's a similar color scheme or it's just a similar framing or whatnot that's not a bad thing you yep. just make sure they look nice but even then there are some uh some channels now that uh they don't they clearly have put very little time into the thumbnails that do well which is i think that's probably a good thing you know yeah yeah um i just don't really know how it works you know youtube keeps changing all the time so yeah after that hour of absolutely useless uh <laughs> useless tips and tricks from a couple of uh couple of creators that was relevant a couple of months ago but now you're on your own <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um yeah i think the, the, to sort of sum it up just genuinely try to make compelling content be the creator that you want to be don't try don't you know pick a niche you know but don't fall too far into it like i did with the sort of filmmaking and gear thing that's why i pulled out i was like i'm, I'm can to do this um which obviously stunts the growth of the channel but that's not why i'm there you know i've got other reasons for my channel it leads on to to business and other opportunities uh whereas you it's your full-time gig and it, you know it is what it is so yeah just enjoy the process i think and yeah, if you're not enjoying videos, there's no point making them. Exactly. You know, like it's it, even if if it's if it becomes a, a full time job, if you if you get to that point, of course there are days when you think I, you know I don't necessarily want to shoot today, and you have to. But that's that's more of a, an existential thing. You have to realize that I'm in a very fortunate position now, and yeah, it's what gets me out of bed in the morning. A lot of people think it's uh you know I just it's just getting up and eating food. What gets me up out of bed is the is the the, the desire to entertain people, which sounds really corny. But that's the only thing I have. And I'm very limited in terms of my talents, right? <laughs> so I wake up and I think, what can I do? Oh, people love these videos. What can I do that's going to make people a bit happier today? I'll go make a 10 minute video. And that's that's the headspace I need to get in to uh, to make things. But yeah, just be genuine, you know, do what you want to do. The, the moment it becomes like you, hard work, and you know, I don't want to do this shit anymore. Then, you you know, you've stopped. The ball has stopped rolling at that point. Yeah. So you need to either change ball <laughs> or, um, or, or, you know, just quit altogether, you know. But but I mean, don't, don't quit, don't quit. <laughs> that's a beautiful way to end it. So uh, again, thanks for uh, watching and listening or where, wherever you've consumed it. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter. You can follow me at the Josh Goodgen. You can follow Beard, Beard Meets Food everywhere. Um, Not and, TikTok though, or Snapchat. Yeah, or, or either <laughs> of those places. If you've got any ideas for guests or topics or anything that you're interested in, feel free to tag us on, uh, like I said, Instagram or Twitter. We're going to take on board what the audience wants because um, we're enjoying this process and uh, yeah, we'll catch you on the next one. Peace.